The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. Welcome to the T Tuesday Updates. Our top stories this week. Uh, uh, intertile events uh, finally have some progress in it. Intertile event is the whole idea of being able to do tiled soft, tiled hardware, where you can have lots of tiles that connect to each other, and the computation doesn't have to really know about it, because it can have events that happen entirely on one tile, or that happen on an edge, and start affecting other tiles. I've been blocked upon this for a while now, and I really think that the idea was was that I thought it was going to be simpler than it was, and I thought I was going to be able to just make small tweaks on the existing code base so I could just try like the easy low-hanging fruit part of intertile events. Um, but every time I tried to do that, I would just get myself into more and more trouble. So this week I did uh, step back and I didn't write any code at all. I just wrote text and made lists of things and tried to design state machines to say, when you're being a tile and you're waiting for an event to begin, then do this and so on and so forth, and draw pictures. Uh, just like the pictures that had had for a while ago for the lock machine, this the lock state that happens down in the Linux kernel. The, the all these state machines are running up in user space in MFMT2, the thing that's actually doing all of the logic for programming. Um, Still not happy with it. You can see this is clearly a work in progress. You have arrows that go nowhere and so forth. But I feel good that. Uh, Th this route can lead to actual progress. So that's the news there. Uh, there's, uh, so each tile has six intertile connectors. Each intertile connector needs its own state machine because they can be doing events on behalf of neighboring tiles independent of whatever the tile is doing as far as events of its own, almost independent of. So that's the story uh, on the intertile events. It's less progress than, again, as always, than I would like, but at least it's starting to move, so that's good. Also, zone frame production advances. So the, the zone frames are these things that, you know, that we have that snap together and uh, uh, are going to support uh, groups of tiles from the back. We've been trying to build them and design them for a while. Uh, got something that we were happy with and was actually just trying to crank them out. Oh, yeah, well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, um, and here they are. Uh, these are not good buckets. Uh, uh, we've got uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Each of these is eight frame pieces. This is the special non-black frame that I'm thinking of being the power zone that has the key master in it. Uh, uh, this is six. We need ten or maybe eleven to have a spare. So we're more than halfway there, uh, uh, although still got quite a bit to do. Uh, I've got another order for the jet black PETG filament, the plastic uh, because, and in fact, as you can see in this picture, uh, uh, the previous roll was starting to run out while it was printing one of these uh, zone frame uh, uh, pieces. Uh, um, I had gotten confident enough, uh, uh, you know, supposedly the Prusa i3 Mark III has a filament out sensor built into the head. Uh, so that it can tell when the sensor runs out. Now, the version I have, which hasn't been upgraded, use uh, a light sensor looking at the filament, and if you had light-colored or transparent filament, it could get fooled. This was a known problem. It's been fixed in later revisions. I haven't uh, upgraded. But this is black filament, so it's, like, totally fine. Uh, and finally, I said, come on, let's just see it work. Let's just... And every time I would watch it get close to the end, I would chicken out and stop before it actually... The plastic disappeared in into the thing enough so that the filament out sensor could trigger. I let it trigger. There it is. It's almost gone <laughs> now. And uh, then it did stop. And it displayed the thing and said, you know, uh, press filament, press the knob or whatever it was. Uh, and it was supposed to back out the filament. I pressed the knob. The filament did not back out. I heard the, the gears inside going nye, 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 to try to push it out. It didn't come out. And thus began another terrifying. <laughs> 
3D printing story. Uh, this is the story of 3D printing in, in 2019, at least in uh, Dave's story. Uh, um, and then it asks you whether the filament uh, 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 unload worked correctly, and it hadn't. So it says, please open idler and remove filament manually. Well, well thanks. I'm, uh, I appreciate you saying please. Uh, um, I got out the stuff. I started working at it. You know, my uh, you can see my print head's getting kind of <laughs> dirty. There's been uh, quite a bit of filaments going through this thing. Uh, but I opened it up uh, and got into it as best I could uh, and tried to remove the filament through the idler, the open uh, gate there. Uh, I got this piece of it out. It was, you know, partly melted and all horrible, and I had to really kind of pull on it pretty hard. But it still didn't get, I couldn't load from the top successfully. It was still jammed. I didn't know what to do. Finally, you know, and this is, you know, the, the more experience you get with something, kind of the more cavalier you get about it. Well, you know, I went at it with the Dremel and <laughs> drill bit, just going, nerd, uh, uh, in uh from the top uh trying to get a piece out and i did there, there was another piece that was jammed in there that i managed to drive down now i tried punching several things you know with bits of uh coat hanger and whatnot to try to dislodge it the, the dremel is what did it uh tried to load it and it actually loaded and in fact oh you know, yeah so there's the piece that came out so it went down in the process of trying to go back up it folded in half and wedged itself in there pretty darn good uh, uh in any event i've learned my lesson don't trust the filament out center sensor ever uh, uh but we are back in business and, and eventually i switched over to the urban gray petg to print that uh lighter colored uh, zone frame that you saw a moment ago so that's the story there also uh, uh, a Q&A uh, from last week when I uh, was showing the, the pipe hangers that were going to carry each set of uh, power zone frames. Uh, and I was still, you know, I had done some extra support here because there's some flex, some bend in the where it, the pipe hook joins into the back of the frame. Uh, Nathan uh, King asked the very logical question, or I mean, made the very logical comment. Maybe you could eliminate the flexing in the hanging hardware by repositioning the base of the hook to be the center of balance in line with the hanging rod instead of justified to the back of the hook. Well, that makes sense. Uh, uh, I decided to give it a try. And, uh, you know, so this this is what I had been using. This was the latest version that I had. This is the piece that connects to the uh, power zone frames. This is the piece that goes over the hanging rod. Uh, uh, they, they go together, and I had shrunk it up. And, and so the idea was, you know, could we make this attachment point closer to the midpoint of the rod uh, uh, like that? So I designed one like this, sort of like much more like a question mark. Uh, uh, and I, I printed up a stack uh, to try out the thing. Uh, uh, um, and sh there they were. T it took a while, uh, um, and 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 there it is. And it seems pretty reasonable. I actually I sort of kind of like the contrast and color for the for the pipe hook part of it, because in a way that's not the scalable piece of it, right? You know that that's the part that's just being done for this demo for this particular mounting application. So kind of making it a different color sort of makes sense from that point of view, but there is a remaining problem with it because of the just as nathan was pointing out the center of gravity and because the frame goes along the back of everything and all of the weight except for the frame itself is on one side the center of gravity does not go through the frame itself so here you can see it's kind of hanging off uh to the back uh, uh, as we go and in fact i did kind of think about this and that's why i actually had had it sort of at the back the idea was to make it rigid enough so that if the center of gravity is somewhere in between the front of the uh, the tiles and the frame that it would be somewhat underneath this thing if we had enough strength to hold it rigid i mean we could try to have hooks or something or cables running down the front to balance out the load but i was hoping not to do that at the same time these these guys i did like them because actually the 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 curve that goes around the thing in this i designed it to be a little bit more than 180 degrees so it kind of pops on and pops off 
off the rod rather than just hanging totally by gravity feels a little bit more secure. So I think I probably will keep it the thing toward the back so that the net center of gravity is more or less under the center of the rod and just deal with the flex uh, by strengthening things up a little bit. But I think I may also try to see if I can't get a little button, a little uh, snap on for the uh, hooks as well. So anyway, Nathan, thank you for the suggestion. You know, sort of these obvious things that you get so close to one's own design. I get so close to my own design, I don't even think of alternatives uh, uh, to it. And, you know, it's it's good to be reminded. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it might have been nice, thinking back of it afterwards, if we could have arranged so that the, the power zone frame was closer to the tiles, closer to the center of gravity, and the little feet uh, socket pops were going through the back of the frame and so forth. But that ship has sailed. All right. Uh, there's another view. So that's the view of the old one uh, um, that, that does get the thing to hang a little better at the expense of having a little bit more flex in the thing. All right. So that's the story on the news of the day. Uh, uh, our feature in our last couple of minutes, I want to talk more about uh, the stuff that I was doing in Ulam 5 and actually try to show a debugging demo because this is a work in progress. Uh, one of the things I have wanted to do for a very long time in Ulam is develop a library for doing bonds, like chemical bonds, like this guy wants to bond with that guy, and once they bound, they kind of stay together, they can still move around, and they can break the bonds and reconnect the bonds and so on. It's very useful to have stuff like that to build flexible structures that can persist but still move. And that's the whole trade-off that we're trying to get in the movable feast, is getting stuff that can uh, perform some integrated structure bigger than just individual atoms and yet still be movable. A and I've made a lot of progress in the last week on using this multiple inheritance in Ulam 5 to do, uh, to do that. And the trick is uh, I've got a base class that has all of these general things. I mean, the whole idea of robust first programming, it follows a typical pattern. And for each of the elements that you're writing, what what I've starting to emerge as the programming paradigm is step one is you do a consistency check. At the beginning of every event, you look at all your the, your redundancies that you have. I have a bond to that guy. He should have a bond to me. So you double check. Is that still true? And if it isn't, you have some pre-specified action that you take, like break the bond, erase yourself, whatever it is. And that's just part of the logic of the thing, that if it detects an inconsistency, it's going to go ahead and fix it uh, in some way right there. Uh, and so then I developed these little, uh, where are they, uh, this little Bondo guys. Uh, uh, so here's the trick. So there's a class called Bond that we're making that's actually a template, meaning that you can get tons and tons and tons of classes from it by putting in different values of the template parameters. So this is a Bond that takes an arbitrary tag. I gave it B-O-D-O -O in hexadecimal. It's like Bondo. There's no N in hexadecimal, so it's Bodo. Uh, um, and it has true or false saying which end of the Bond it is, because each Bond is oriented. And then then how many units away in the event window you can see it. So this is a length three bond uh, that's, you know, the true end of the Bodo. And then we also have one that's the false end of the Bodo. And so the idea is once you can make multiple instances of this bond class by changing the template parameters, and then you can use uh, template, uh, you can use multiple inheritance mid Bondo to try them out. This is going to go a little bit long. I'm going to go longer than my 15 minutes. I did two of them and manages to stay under, but I'm going to go a little bit long here. All right. Uh, uh, so the idea here is we have a class head bond, Bondo that has a single bond. Where's head Bondo? Uh, uh, there it is. It, it has the base class Bondo that everybody's going to be supplying stuff uh, specific for the Bondo demo. And then it also has a Bondo from. Uh, uh, a tail Bondo is the same thing except it has a Bondo to. And the mid bondo has both, like that. And so we have a seed. Uh, uh, this is the other another thing about uh, robust first programming is that generally you have the thing construct itself from a single element, which is a seed. So we have a seed bondo. All right. So let's try all this because uh, this thing has got a bug in it uh, that I've I've actually made some progress debugging, but I decided to show you the bug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 instead, because it's, it's kind of a useful thing to know about. I mean, I know a lot of folks aren't uh, programmers, and even the ones who are programmers are really not very many of them are Ulam programmers. But this is important for the f 
for the folks that are, and just for understanding how things tend to work in uh, movable feast machine robust first programming. So we make a seed. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this guy all the way on the right. That's the arrow. Uh, and now I have a yellow border around this tile. And you can have it on any of them. Uh, um, I don't remember how to get rid of it. Uh, there it is. Right click to get rid of it. Uh, uh, but I'm just going to do this one. And what that yellow border means is, is that now now events are being recorded uh, um, and if I now go ahead and I deliver an event again using the magic wand tool that we saw last week uh, uh, on the seed bondo it pops out into a head bondo a mid bondo and a tail bondo that's what the seed does but there's also this red outline and that's coming from the event recording system and the red outline means we're sitting right after an event if it was a green outline it would mean we were sitting right before an event so if we go back in time Time. there it is there's the seed bondo again now the frame is green because we're before the event we're after the event nice uh, uh, we can use the atom view inspector uh, you can click right to pop up multiple ones click left to just pick the uh, select the, uh, one of them uh, there it is. So, so here's our head bondo. This is probably going to be a little small. Maybe if I crowd it in here, I can zoom in and post. Uh, so the head bondo has a bond site going to one. Well, what is one? Uh, uh, we need our event window image always available. So site one is to the left and to the left of head bondo is indeed the mid bondo. And in the mid bondo also has a site one because it's always relative to, to you and the mid bondo and he's got the tail guy and so forth. So, and then the, he's also got a four, which is the other side to the east to bring him back in. It's all looks perfect. If we let uh, a guy have an event, uh, uh, let's see, did he do anything? Uh, why didn't he do anything? I don't know why he didn't do anything. Uh, why don't we just let him run? Uh, uh, okay, now, <laughs> what happened? We lost our bondos. Well, that's because there was a bug. And uh, when something de detects an inconsistency, it, it suicides. And once one of them suicided, the other ones detect inconsistencies because they thought they were connected to something that's no longer there. So they suicide, so the whole thing evaporates. Normally, you would just say, rats, I missed the event. But with the event recorder, we just go back in time. And we can go back as far as we need to go. Uh, uh, and we can go forward. Uh, so there it was right there. So we lost our tail bondo somehow. Now, why don't we uh, pick up this guy? Uh, whoops, I delivered an event. I did not want to deliver an event there. I wanted to move our guy. Uh, so there it is. So uh, the head bondo is looking at bond site 11. 11 is two down. That's where it belongs. And so the mid bondo is pointing at... 11 for the next one see that's messed up also and I figured out actually and, and so in the next events we can watch this thing uh, yeah in fact the mid bondo said I don't make any sense I'm gone uh, later the tail bondo picked it up and did the same thing and so forth uh, uh, but uh, we can now go back further and that's what it was to so see what the event was do we still have it yeah uh, um, the mid bondo's up here, the tail bondo's down there, and the actual bug is, well, I guess I overwrote it, the actual bug in this case is when they're just moving around into empty squares, it works fine, but when they're working, when they swap with each other just at random, the third guy can get messed up, and you know, I knew that was coming, it's just a bug. Anyway, the event recorder lets you go back in time, <laughs> as long as you don't inadvertently hit the magic wand and make more events while you're in the past, because it'll do it, but it overwrites the future ahead of you. It's a big help in along with the atom view panels that we see here these atom view panels have also now been extended to include the type the base class that the data members come to because these darn mid bondos they got two bond sites one for the uh, bondo from and one for the bondo to all right that's it The next update will be out in a week. It's the last week of October, which means I have to make a decision about what I'm going to do in November. We'll talk about that next week. Sorry I went so long. Thanks for being here.